My guest today is Tootie Damien. Tootie, how are you doing, sir? Uh, good. Very good. It's just been a few months since we last spoke. Anything new? That's true. Uh, well, a lot of stuff. If you're talking about security, there's new stuff coming up every day, so you never get bored. Yeah, that's true. I, I, now you, we, we, the reason we scheduled a second one is because you brought up something in the last conversation about how this pandemic, which we're coming up on two years of um, working from home and all the f social effects the pandemic has had, and uh, among the effects that it's had is security, which is which is your field. Uh, why mm -hmm. is uh, what does a pandemic have to do with computer security? Uh, well, it has everything to do. I mean, anything that happens in the world has to do with uh, mostly computers nowadays. Okay. And by association, computer security. So um, the fact that the pandemic has influenced the way people use IT, the security behind that was obviously also affected. And uh, a major thing and an obvious thing was the huge shift to remote work that happened yeah. in the early days of the pandemic with people having to work from home and um companies having to deal with the large amount of people working from home it yeah, wasn't scale, something scalability new. was a big issue yep. for things like like teams which we're using right now exactly so it's it it's not that companies were not uh aware that this could be done they were not prepared for the scale at which people needed access to resources and while before you might have a few people working remotely and traveling and working from home through a VPN or something, all of a sudden you had your entire staff doing that at the same time. So that put a strain on internet connections, that put a strain on the available bandwidth in data centers and on actual devices handling all the secure communications to and from the office. Um, in some cases, companies that did not have enough licenses to handle multiple simultaneous connections. You yeah. only license a set number of, say, uh, concurrent VPN connections if you're using VPN. And uh, no company ever assumed that everyone's going to be working from home at some point. So um, that also came with additional costs that also came with uh, the strain on IT staff having to deal with all the issues of people having never worked from home now having to use their um, home Wi-Fi and their um, their home setup uh, to yeah. to access company files and company applications and things like that so yeah. um, we that, forget that, that was... as as IT guys, we kind of forget the rest of the world doesn't come to the same place we do. So it's like school teachers, for example, suddenly had to learn a lot about remote exactly. work. And and exactly. the kids, well, the kids probably knew more already, but some of these kids are, you know, first, second grade. That's true. So I I, I think that's the by far the most obvious impact that the pandemic had, even if it if we're talking just about the early days. Yeah. Um the next the next wave, I think, uh, in what we've seen was um, around attacks that had the pandemic, that had COVID as sort of a pretext. And you would start seeing these show up um, worldwide. And that was back in March, April, May of last year of 2020. Um, a lot of attacks uh, started to show up uh, being related to, to COVID-19, especially phishing attacks. Um, people started getting emails about um, maybe, I don't know, how do you do groceries now that COVID is around and you have to set, stay at home and here's a link. And that link was a, a phishing link or um, uh, claiming benefits. Like yeah. here are your benefits for the month of April for COVID. Yeah. And you're I like, get, oh, I'm I get, getting I get, money. A, yeah. I get a lot of those text messages. 
Yeah, so so there were a lot of these kinds of attacks that used the the current news as like a, a pretext to piggyback on and to mm. kind of put people in a position where they would click on the link. Because there's Any, already a built in yeah. fear, uncertainty and doubt. They're just playing on that. Exactly. Exactly. So they didn't have to to work on the message that much. Um, they had that already. They had a topic that was of interest. They would just need to to start um, spamming it as much yeah, as exploiting possible. it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's um, it's another obvious thing if you work in the industry to see how the local and regional events affect trends in the types of phishing scams and malware um, because it does go back to the human nature of like being afraid being curious about stuff and whatever nerve you touch when you, you know, when you send an email if that makes that person click that link that's enough if it's the more personal it is or the more serious it is in the grand scheme of things yeah. um you're you're more likely to have people clicking um clicking links and emails yeah so because you're because you're frightening them yeah exactly so i think that was um the the second major thing that hit the um the industry and that hit the world at large now there's some things that aren't as obvious but the trends are there um, and one that comes to mind is the increase in uh, state sponsored uh, attacks or uh, any sort of cyber attacks by state sponsored actors um, think of attacks that target identities and supply chains it's it's those cases where a particular security provider was hacked and they provided uh, devices and security for a number of large companies. Hmm. And so uh, the hackers would be able to get into the networks of said companies. Combine that with the fact that most IT staff was now working from home. These have started really growing in, in, um, in size and complexity about the, the mid to late half of last year. Um, hmm. And consider that when you when you target a supply chain, when you target a company that that I don't know uh, designs and implements security uh, software or devices or software used by uh, MSPs by managed service providers, the moment you attack one of those solutions, you gain access to all the companies or all the customers using that solution instead. So don't go for the for the end target for one company. You go for whatever channel you can use to access a number of companies. Right. And it's it's not a new thing. This has happened in the past. Um, I'm thinking of, for instance, New Petya, uh, the ransomware that started somewhere in Ukraine, and the way it spread was by uh, an attack that was launched against a company that would that that uh, developed a an accounting software that was very specific to Ukrainian uh, law and Ukrainian yeah. tax finances and whatnot. So a lot of small and medium businesses were using that piece of software. Yeah. So the moment the ransomware hit uh the the servers of this company and used their own update and distribution mechanism for their application to access all their customers which are companies smbs Good. um you would have in a few hours um 80 percent of said companies probably infected i don't remember the exact numbers but it was huge and it was fast it, so this this is this is not the first time this happened. It is, however, um, the first time that that the scale and complexity of these kinds of attacks has increased that much. And the fact that IT staff was working from home, like I said, didn't help much mm. because uh, now if you weren't in the office or in the data center, it might be harder for you to 
get a hold of um, somebody to to actually go and fix it or physically unplug stuff if needed, for instance, right? Hmm. Um, so so there were a, a number of uh, a number of things, and even incidents such as um, systems going down and you needing to to use on-prem staff that's trained to fix it staff that now you wouldn't have on prem as you used to mm. would add hours or days to the resolution of, of those incidents so Tough to it's, fix a hardware yeah. problem remotely yeah yeah any if anyone ever tried they would know what what we're talking about so i i i think um off the top of my head these would probably be the the major things that we've seen um uh, impact the the market at large. Um, well, it's been almost two years since this whole thing started, and yep. are we are we getting better at solving these problems or adapting to them than we were a year ago? Um, well, I I would say the short answer is yes, but the long answer is comes in two parts. I think on one side. It's yes, because companies have to do it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they're, they're going to be out of business. I, the companies that weren't able to handle the work from home policies, it, it, in, in obviously, in, obvious, in, the, in the cases where the companies could do that, uh, not in cases where it's impossible due to the nature of the work. But the companies that were able to adapt quickly were the companies that survived and thrived even in the new economy, the what what's it called now, the low touch economy, right? Um, so even uh, as uh, as the months um, went by, companies that were able to adapt and were able to to quickly react uh, are now far better off. So mm. it was mostly out of necessity. Right. Um, in in a lot of cases, companies were already in a quote unquote digital transformation initiative, and they were working on bringing the cloud to the daily lives of all their um, staff. This had maybe accelerated that, that process. Yeah, that that just accelerated that process from months or years. It came down to weeks or else. Right. Right. <laughs> so right. Yeah. Was, so the ones that didn't adapt, yeah. many of them just did not survive. Yeah. Uh, but also, so this is the second part of, of the answer. Um, also, I think there's now a much higher concern on security, on how to better handle your data wherever it may be. And while before it was most of, mostly a nice to have feature, being able to control access to the data and documents, whether they're on your servers, in the cloud, on uh, the personal device of someone uh, in your in your company, like their mobile phone or their personal laptop, you still want the same level of control that you had before. So companies started looking at these tools that existed for a while. They were just not getting used. Um, and they started assessing the need for for this kind of an approach where you look at security in a in a wholly different way, and um, I've I've been I've been uh, talking uh, quite a bit even since our last uh, chat about uh, what's called zero trust. No, uh, define define zero trust, please. Uh, zero trust is a security initiative. It's it's a set of. Um, solutions, tools, and processes that help you better take care of um, the uncertainty of who, uh, who accesses your data, where that data gets accessed, um, trying to address um, three major things. Like one, um, trying to shift to sort of an explicit verification of identifying the identities of all users and accounts, the location, the the health of their devices, the wor workload they're trying to access, and 
not just limiting yourself to say user X connected to the VPN. So now they have access to the entire set of applications and tools that we have in our company. It's more of a user X connected to the VPN. Now, should user X be connecting from the location that they're connecting from at this time of day, and they're trying to access application Z, should they be able to access that application? Are they allowed to in this security context? So looking at a more granular approach and trying to identify uh, any anomalies as fast as possible trying to identify um, the difference, say for instance, between a legitimate user working on an Excel sheet on a Wednesday at 3 p.m. and the same user trying to download two terabytes of Excel sheets off the company servers on a Saturday at 2 a.m. Could it be that the second case is just that user's compromised uh, credentials, right. and it's actually a hacker trying to do that and not the user himself. Being able to distinguish between these two things is part of this zero trust approach. Um, it also comes with um, somewhat common approaches such as just in time and just enough access, right. giving an account or a user just enough level of access to do what they need to do and revoking that automatically after they're done, not just granting them privileges and forgetting about it. And then two years later, you figure out that because you gained some admin privileges because you had to change a DNS record two years ago, and now your account has been compromised, the hacker was able to change the same DNS settings. You haven't used that in two years. Why would you still need those? permissions to to uh, linger. So, so the zero trust yeah. comes from the, we start with the assumption that the system will yep. not trust the person or the device or the system, other system that's accessing yep. it, and we incrementally add based on exactly. something verifiable information, the, the resource, access to resources that exactly. they can, and you you can own, you only those anomalies? resources. Exactly. And, and you try and identify any sort of anomalies. And this, this goes, so what you described also goes into what's called the assume breach approach. Well, um, assume bad intent. <laughs> yes, uh, which boils down to thinking in terms of not what can I do to prevent myself from getting hacked, but what can I do to detect if I've already been hacked? What would be different on my servers, in my applications, in my data? Have reason why this is necessary is because um, the the current trends in the industry show that on average, and this is the average in the industry, hackers gain and maintain access for six to nine months before they are detected. Mm. That's not ours. Because, that's not because, based. Because we're not looking for them. Because we're not looking for them. And if we are not looking for them, and if we're not looking for signs of the breach, we're just assuming that we have done our best to protect ourselves against a breach. So we're not looking forward to having been breached and to like looking at things in terms of, hey, I've just been hacked. Now what? What's my incident response policy? How do I detect this and how do I uh, instantly block it and how do I remediate this? Um, because you're you're just not used to thinking in those terms, and that's detrimental to your security. So the the whole working from home uh, part has triggered the the increased adoption of zero trust everywhere. Yeah. And do you think um, this was a good test for GDPR? So that those laws are not that old, and all of a sudden, a couple of years in. Um, we hit this major crisis in our society. I I do believe this was a good trial run, let's say, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when it comes to to data classification and to identifying what sort of data you uh, collect, store, and process, and how you do it, and who has access to it, that's part of of what I was talking about before. Yeah. 
and being able to identify who's accessing your data and from where and why and for how long and for what purpose is essential to GDPR and to your data in general. GDPR should just make the distinction between personally identifiable information and the rest of your data, but the principles should stay the same. You should still be able to control your data wherever it is. You should still be able to tell who's accessing it and why and yeah. what they're doing with it. So it doesn't matter if it's PII or not, or it shouldn't matter. Yeah, I think uh, when GDPR first was implemented, the uh, the the big change that I saw everybody implemented was just putting a button on their website that said accept these cookies, which yep. didn't which really was... seem like a high priority to me. And maybe yep. maybe this pandemic has forced them to address the re very real issues. So I think I think there were three there there were three waves for GDPR, and I've I've caught all of them. One was the panic right before. So in the, I think, six months before GDPR came into effect, uh, we've seen a very large number of requests of companies asking us to, hey, can we please get some help with implementing GDPR internally? Because it's coming and we want to just avoid having any sort of trouble, getting fined and so on. So that yeah. was right before. After GDPR came into effect, people just looked around and said, hey, so wait, so nothing's happening, sort of this is the new Y2K thing, and <laughs> they just stopped. Yeah. A few months in, the first major fines started to, to pour in, and especially around Europe, a lot, a lot of large companies were fined huge amounts of money that made the news. This is when, again, a new wave came in, like, uh, so, you know, GDPR came into effect a few months ago, we've still kind of touched the surface barely so we still need help please help that was the second wave and i think the third wave uh did indeed come with uh with the whole remote work and accessing data remotely and okay. having to deal with uh with this kind of a, a, a level of control that companies didn't have on their data before and yeah this this was part of it for yeah, sure. I think I think that third wave is uh, if you want to look for something positive, people are more taking it seriously as opposed to just trying to avoid fines and you know dot their eyes and cross their T's here mm -hmm. uh, because there are some very real risks that are manifesting themselves. Then that, they're, they're attacking the issue rather than just yeah checking off that boxes I well. that I can confirm. Um, there's a lot more requests percentage wise. Um, that I've seen in recent months coming from customers that are trying to prevent and they're trying to uh, be proactive in their security approach. To a request from the market like GDPR or from a customer saying that I'm not going to give you the, the final lump of money for your software project until it goes through a security check and uh, then uh, the the ISVs, the software companies come and say, well, we don't know security. We need some training or we need some assistance or we need some pen tests done or security assessments done before we give this to the customer telling the customer that it's secure because we don't feel like it is, because we haven't focused on that. That's good for uh, folks so, like you that have that security and can uh, uh, yeah. make the world a little bit safer and make a living doing it. I know, and like I was saying, um, it used to be mostly, and by mostly it's roughly 90, 95%, the case that companies would come asking for any sort of security training or assessment or anything, as a result of something, of a data breach, of a customer request, of a market compliance requirement or something. Yeah, and re, it's less and less, exactly. And it's I, I'm seeing less and less of that, and I'm seeing more and more companies coming with a like more a proactive approach. And that's that's, um, that's definitely a, a positive trend. Well, Tudi, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. And I hope you and your family stay safe. As always, a pleasure talking to you and the, the same to you.
when it comes to security, um, it's you're better off uh, using the right technology with the help of your friends that can uh, provide that insight. If you've got friends in the IT industry uh, working on security, it's uh, it's certainly advantageous to to talk to them, especially in the current context.